with this professor, and he said, well, come to my office. He's 88 years old. He's got an office, right? So what you doing, John? So I talked for about an hour and a half about all this neural stuff. Okay, he's listening. He's asking good questions. And then he says, well, let me tell you what I'm working on. So he goes to the board and he tells me about some problem in quantum mechanics or fluid mechanics or something. Amazing. <laughs> I also had a mentor at the NIH. You'll hear about him later. He's also the same age. He also gave a talk at my 65th birthday symposium. Not many of us can say that we're going to be like that. Okay. So about this time of my PhD was a guy who was uh, a mathematician. He had been at NIH in the group that I became part of later on. And this guy was a rigorous mathematical analyst. So he looked at this, he developed this picture of this surface kind of representation. And he proved powerful mathematical theorems about this. I told you, as you change the speed c, the estimate for the speed c, you either come around and pass above this surface or below this surface. That's for the fast wave, the stable one. For the unstable one, you pass from below to above as you vary the speed in a particular direction. That movement through that surface enabled Evans, Evans to prove the stability. It was an abstract mathematical statement about how that estimate passes through that surface. I don't know if he ever computed the solution to the Hodgkin-Huxley equations or the Fitzhugh-Nagumo equations. It was his deep mathematical insight, John Evans. So he produced a, a function from the behavior of the solutions near that surface that is the thing you want to compute if you want to test the stability. That function is now used in many different applications in studying differential equations. It's called, it's called the Evans function. Pure mathematics. This guy told me something that I've never forgotten. Um, he was a deep thinking kind of guy, but a very normal kind of, let's have a conversation about this, that, or the other thing kind of guy. And we were talking about who does good work, who doesn't do good work, and he would say, oh, that's, that's a trend, okay? That's gonna die away after a while. He said, the most important criteria about your work is, or somebody's work is, will people be paying to attention, attention to it 25 years from now or 50 years from now? That's the criteria, is the lifetime of the ideas and the concepts. I never forgot uh, his statement about that. So Hodgkin and Huxley, this is what we still do today. Hodgkin and Huxley like stuff. That we don't need. So I don't need to talk about that. This is a picture. This is a picture. Is that a red squirrel? Do you have red squirrels? <laughs> this is a picture from a Gordon conference in 1973. This is almost 40 years ago now. Have you heard of the Gordon Research Conferences? These are intensive conferences in many different scientific areas. They're for one week, okay? There's many of them in the summer. And they're usually held at a small college or high school in the northeastern part of the US. There's usually some, maybe 100 people at the most. Some talks in the morning, some talks in the evening, afternoons are free for sitting on the grass, talking, going for hikes, going swimming, playing sports and so on. But you're there, everybody together, you eat all your meals together, and it's a great way of learning about science and talking to the personalities that are involved. So if you ever get a chance, think about going to a Gordon conference. So here is this Gordon conference in 1973. Okay, that's me right there, 1973. Um, who else can I identify on this picture? 
This is uh, Nancy Coppell, I think. This is um, this is Jack Cowan, I believe. This is Rene Tom. You know Rene Tom, the famous catastrophe theory mathematician. He was at this Gordon conference, and I think this is the Gordon. Uh, well, let me see. I'm going to show you another one in just a minute. This is Leon Glass, Bruce Knight, so on. Some figures in the field, Hirsch Cohen. Let me see if I've got another one. So this tells you the ring. This was a garden conference on theoretical biology. This was 1970s, early, when there was very few people who thought theoretical biology was going to amount to anything, OK? Because it was a bunch of, there wasn't any quantitative information. There was very little quantitative information in most of biology. People were trying to make models of development and so on um, without enough data. So the people that were experimentalists that wanted to talk to theorists would come to this conference. And you would get some of the primary thinkers in the field coming to this conference grappling with how you quantify, how you build a model. That's the challenge in making mechanistic models in biology. You don't have Newton's equations. You don't have the equations of mechanics. You are grappling with what should be the equations. OK, you have reaction, you have diffusion, and so on. But the geometry is also very complicated. OK. I gave my talk on that at this conference. Nancy Coppell and Lou Howard were working on spatial patterns in the belyusov jabotinsky reaction at that time. That's how Nancy Coppell got her start. Ah, this is the Gordon conference. Stephen Smale, the famous nonlinear dynamicist, and Rene Tom were at this conference together. And boy, did the lightning, lightning emerge at that conference because they had two totally different points of view about that. Steve Smale was a rigorous dynamicist, and Rene Tom was drawing pictures, pictures of singularities. I'll show you in the next slide, OK? This is an example of catastrophe theory, OK? They were drawing pictures of multi-valued surfaces. Rene Tom was famous for his, for describing the kind of singularities that can occur in multi-dimensional surfaces and geometries. Here we see a fold in this surface coming together with a fold in the lower surface. So when you project this down, you see a cusp. This is the famous cusp catastrophe of catastrophe theory. Okay? So they would draw surfaces like this and say, this explains the dynamics of a dog going from a passive state to an aggressive state, okay? The dog, his mood is changing. He's kind of calm here, okay? He's avoiding confrontation, but as anxiety builds up in him, boom, there's an explosion, and he goes into attack mode, okay? Then there's a recovery from attack mode, and he comes back in this direction and falls back down to the resting state, on and off aggression, okay? So this was what they called a model. And they made models for um, what? Um, uh, this is uh, depression. I, oh, cathartic release from self-pity was this model. This is the behavior of the stock market. They're showing us all of these models without quantification, without any real mechanisms in it. This was the model for anorexia nervosa. So this led to um, a lot of controversy in the literature, catastrophe theory. The emperor has no clothes, okay, revealing that there's nothing behind it. Um, is catastrophe theory dangerous, okay? So this was a battle that was going on in the, in the mid-70s. Bart Ehrmantraut uh, said, I think there's a C-word conspiracy here, because he pointed to several other trendy kind of things Catastrophe theory, chaos, connectionism, complex systems, criticality, calcium. That's all part of Bard's C word uh, theory. If you know Bard, if you've ever, yeah, you can understand this. 
So I said that, you know, this chemical system discovered by uh, Jabotinsky and Zeichman and Balyusha was an exemplar for excitability in a chemical system. Nerve excitation was a model system that they sometimes related to in terms of excitability. Art Winfrey was a pioneer in using the geometrical viewpoint of system dynamics, okay? And of stepping back and trying to understand the qualitative properties of dynamical biological systems. So he was, this was his picture on the cover of Scientific American in 1974 of the belyusov jabotinsky reaction. Who's heard of this reaction? This chemical reaction that if spatially homogeneous, okay, goes through phases of different colors, you use indicators, and it will just oscillate for long periods of time, eventually run down, of course, unless you keep putting in new chemicals, okay? But in a spatially distributed system, like a thin Petri dish, you see spatial patterns, and these spatial patterns move with time. So like here you see a pair of spiral patterns, and they just keep spinning around and spinning around and spinning around. And um, this led to the notion of spatiotemporal patterns in reaction diffusion systems, okay? Before this um, phenomenon of the nerve impulse, I told you, looks like a diffusion equation, the notion of having a traveling wave, a constant amplitude signal in a reaction diffusion system was unheard of. Okay? Diffusion is something that spreads things out and damps things down. But with nonlinearities, you can get sustained propagation. So things like the nerve impulse and these kind of chemical reactions that will maintain themselves for long periods of time led to a lot of mathematical development, nonlinear reaction diffusion equations with waves. Winfrey did one of the coolest experiments. This looks like a two-dimensional pattern, okay? There's actually some thickness to this, okay? So Winfrey described the, three the possible three-dimensional structures that could be happening in this system that could account for the different kinds of patterns you see when you're looking on the surface, okay? So, this would be called a scroll wave. The center of the three-dimensional pattern is just perpendicular to the upper surface and lower surface. How did he discover this? He was kind of a seat-of-the-pants type scientist. I'm going to make it real simple. He put a layer of filters in the dish. He put a layer of filters, paper filters in the dish, very thin papers, okay? And then he somehow froze the reaction, and then he peeled the papers apart. And he could see the pattern on the papers and reconstruct various kind of spatial temporal patterns. Okay? This is a scroll, uh, this is a scroll wave with a tilted, a tilted um, axis. This is a scroll wave where one end of it goes up into the medium and comes back down to the other end. So on top, you would see circles. Okay? Very impressive. Winfrey was all, also famous for understanding biological clocks. He developed a lot of notions about biological clocks and the resetting of clocks through pulses. He was one of the guys who developed the theories of the phase response or phase resetting notions and the notions of isotopes. He alerted us, he alerted us to um, the patterning and the biological oscillations, the oscillations that are seen among fireflies. You know fireflies, right? They light up, they flash at night. Did you know that there are some fireflies that flash in synchrony? There are some species of fireflies in Malaysia that will flash together. I have a video 
of this. It's on a TV, it was on a TV program uh, showing these images and the documentary that goes along with it. So these fireflies, if you're, this is the picture of the river just after, after the sun goes down and you'll see a, a tree just go flash like that. Another tree flash like that, okay? You can take these fireflies, take them, a firefly into the lab, put it on a pinhead, and then with a flashlight, synchronize its firing to your forcing function. The, you can make it fa fire faster if you want, okay? So this was a nice model problem. Should we be taking a break? Was it time? No? It's okay? All right. So Winfrey was interested in various kinds of synchronization. So there are data, there are data about the synchronization of the oscillations that drive your intestine. Okay, your intestine is pushing food through it, right? People have taken the intestine out, looking at the electrical oscillations of the muscle along the intestine, and you find interestingly along the intestine that the frequency is constant along some segments, then it drops down, okay? Constant over a region, constant over a region, and so on. Well, this grabbed the attention of Bart Ehrmanstraut and Nancy Coppell. This was one of their first papers together about this synchronization in this distributed system, 1984. This is where they developed some of the first theories they used of phase oscillators, okay? If you know that a system is following a limit cycle approximately, and the limit cycle is attracting, then for some purposes, all you need to do is keep track of the phase of that oscillator, okay? So they assume a system in which there was a gradient in the period along the length of the intestine, and then you could see that some of them would lock together in synchrony, then there would be a break, lock together in synchrony. So these are some of the solutions they computed with, um, with their phase uh, theory models. Erman Trout was a postdoc in my lab at the time where he became exposed to this program, MRI. Okay, so I'm gonna start a new phase here now. Take a break. <laughs> Anybody that wants to leave can leave. Okay, I'll go on for a little while longer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Только переводите не будем титров. Ну мы не знаем, хорошо. Только Лена yeah. Well, it was probably more about Zimai ah, than Zimai. it was Tom. Yeah. And what because Zimai went around and, you know, publicized yeah. all this yeah. stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. You're right, yeah. And react this way yeah, yeah. or this way. Yeah, yeah, it's polarizing. Yeah, it was very polarizing. Yeah, yeah, I see, yeah, yeah. And the industry of persons who are in front of the Yeah. <laughs> 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 
So I'm going to tell you about now um, some of the things that I was a little bit more directly involved with about the neurons dendrites. And, um, I had the good fortune to have um, two mentors in my during my PhD. One was at the NIH in Bethesda, and I'll tell you about that story in a minute. That was Wilfred Rawl, and the other was my mathematical mentor, Joe Keller, at NYU. This is a, an extraordinary man. Um, this is a very kind, very generous, strong physical intuition man. It was a pleasure to work with him, and anybody who was around him <clears throat> says the same thing. I only learned recently that his name, Wilfred, comes from Wilfredum, wish for peace. And he actually was like that. Um, so Will Rawl did an undergraduate in physics at Yale in 1943. Uh, he went into the Manhattan Project, like other people did. He was at the Fermi Lab in Chicago. And he started looking at biophysics with Casey Cole at the University of Chicago. <clears throat> and he said to Casey Cole, you know, I'm really interested in, so here he was in the Manhattan Project. Right? Um, I'm really interested in um, 